Oh, Eliam, tell us that you got to see some elephant. That's wonderful. Hopefully they hang around and you can view them for a little while. Eliam will try and get into another position. We um, haven't had any more luck just yet. Frank in Ontario, um, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, oh, that's a long way away. Um, Frank, uh, you asked which animal poses the most danger to us as a guide, um, or guides rather. Uh, uh, Frank, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, with, with questions like this, I try and try my best to get people to understand animals. Animals are not dangerous. Um, animals become potentially dangerous when they feel threatened. So if we are um, disrespectful and try and push the boundary and try and push the animals, try get too close, or if we see they're irritated and we continually try and push them, then they will act aggressively. Animals have two two states. They basically will run if they feel threatened or afraid, or they will attack to protect themselves. That's it. So the animals are not considered dangerous. We don't say, oh, that lion's dangerous. No, the lion's potentially dangerous if we, if we push the boundary and agitate them. So again, that's, you know, it's our job and responsibility out here to be respectful of the animals. We are in their natural habitat. We are here to view them and appreciate them. So we should hopefully never get to that situation where animals become that agitated. However, because they're wild animals, you can't necessarily um, predict how they're going to react. We've got an idea, um, you know, with viewing them for so many years. But, but every animal's different. They're wild animals. We don't know. Um, so you do have to be careful and respectful. That's it. Bottom line. Uh, I think the animal that I would be wary of the most in the bush is probably... And I think on a vehicle, um, it would be elephant, most likely, on a vehicle. And purely because they have the power to tip a vehicle over um, or push it over. They, um, they're incredibly strong, powerful animals. So on a vehicle, I would say elephant. Everything else, I don't think is an issue. Um, but on foot, however, I would probably say buffalo for me is one that I'm very cautious of just because they're quite unpredictable and then also a hippo if you bump into a hippo out of the water that can be potentially dangerous because to protect themselves they get quite nervous and to protect themselves they'll just charge and bite down and they can kill people they are responsible for a lot of human deaths but again that's people disturbing them getting in between them and the water where they feel safest so i would say for me it's probably buffalo and, and hippo on foot and then on a vehicle, maybe an elephant, uh, I would say. Those three would be the most potentially dangerous, I think. Um, but again, I think if you're careful, cautious, respectful, you should avoid all situations or conflict with these wild animals. I hope that answers your question. All right, Fergs, let's find something. All right, we're going to find something. I don't know what, something. <laughs> let's find a something. <laughs> Lisa spotted something. Okay. And once we find something, then we can uh, possibly stop for our coffee. A little bit later and I've brought rusks again just to, to feed Ferg so he keeps going <laughs> um, Joshua you asked <laughs> are the animals that can't get a girlfriend <laughs> uh, Joshua uh, I I I Fergs Fergs uh sorry you probably didn't hear what Fergs said there um anyway um <laughs> 
No, I'm trying. Um, Joshua, no, I think in nature, Joshua, animals do need to mate with one another for success of a species. So generally, I think um, all animals will probably find a mate. Um, I, I don't know of situation. I mean, we don't really monitor all the impala herds, for example. There's possibly a chance that, I mean, there's got to be, based on the sheer numbers, that uh, there may be impala that don't get to mate, perhaps. Impala males, I'm not sure, but um, but generally speaking, animals are are or they need to mate rather to to ensure the success of a species. So within nature, there is usually a balance. Let's just have a look at these little buntings that just landed here on the ground. Just caught a glimpse of them. What were they? Oh, they've just moved off now. Interesting flight pattern. I'm just see if I can see see one of them again. Well, the sun is right in our eyes at the moment, so we just caught a silhouette of these little birds. What were they? Oh. Did they land anywhere again? Oh dear, it's just so quick. It's also there's a there's a lovely little bird. Oh, there was a woodpecker that just flew through the trees. Again, these little birds, the woodpeckers, also saw a... Um, so this looked like a little bird party that came past here. Yeah? Uh, yesterday I was asked, what is a bird party? Well, a bird party is basically just when a number of species of birds, different species of birds, all congregate through an area, they move through an area feeding together. Now, there was a woodpecker, I caught a brief glimpse of it, don't know which one it was, um, just saw that it was a woodpecker, it flew off, and then um, and then I saw a little, oh, hang on. looks like a bearded woodpecker that I can see, oh, again, just diving down into the bush, um, and then also saw a black crowned chagra, little shagra flying through the bushes too so shagra woodpecker there were a few other birds but far too quick for us just flying darting through the thicket um, moving through this area so it did look like a bird party an interesting little one nice to see those birds all together we'll see what else we can find I wasn't sure what this was it looked like another little bunting perhaps just by the flight pattern the way it flew you drop something in folks Now, um, Ali's still driving around. It sounds like those elephants have moved off. And for a change, Ali hasn't got an animal to show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Byron. Uh, no, I don't have any animals to show. The Ellie went a bit into the thicket, so we couldn't um, follow up on him so what we've been doing now is actually backtracking the lion and see where they came from just out of interest seems like this guy whoever it is walked quite a distance throughout the night he's like I mean his tracks have cut him all the way from from the eastern side so I wonder if maybe he came from Torchwood maybe from the magic place of Little Gowrie where everybody seems to head on to the other areas of the Sabi San but uh, no animals around here we haven't seen too many things moving around so that's what I, we decided maybe green pigeons well pigeons well spotted i think you have a knack for things that are small and gray hey all right let's look at a beautiful bird Ooh, sorry there we go the brain brain <laughs> green pigeons four of them <laughs> Clever birds, they're also quite cold, puffed up and enjoying the enjoying the sunshine. If I were a bird I would do exactly the same right now. And you see well they're called green pigeons because they resemble a pigeon very much. And they're green. So again another very descriptive name. So there you go, Byron. You were asking for us to get an animal. I challenge you now. Let's see what else he'll be able to find. 
beautiful and they're, oh, they're still looking quite sleepy and there's a cape turtle in the back going boop, brr, boop, brr. Work hard, work hard. Uh, I don't think anyone's like, out of all the birds, we've seen quite a few that are already being very active, moving around, hunting, foraging, looking for food. The oxpeckers on top of the zebras, but I wonder if the pigeons just decided to spend the night in an area that was a bit cooler and now they are going to take a, a bit of a longer time to start moving around because they seem not to, not to be up to too much compared to some of the other birds that we, we have seen this morning. We are in a different area of the reserve, so I wonder if maybe it was actually a bit mistier here because we are close to one of the very famous and hated by everyone drainage lines, so the dry riverbeds. Um, so I wonder if maybe, because it was quite misty around here, and even Craig and I, when we started driving into this area, it got very cold all of a sudden. So I'm sure the pigeons just require a bit of extra um, sunlight just to warm up a little bit more. But we'll see. I think maybe I'll be brave enough to take off my gloves. First layer of the day done. Now that the sun is shining, let's carry on and see what else there is around here. Hopefully more ellies. It would be quite nice to see more elephants around here. And if not, I think there is somewhere not too far from here, there is a hawk eagle nest. And I would like to go see that and see what the eagles have been up to. Also, this is a good area for buffalo. Like all the buffaloes that I've seen on Juma have pretty much been around here. So I wonder. And then we'll clearly we've had lots of what well, it seems lots of things moving around here. You see the dung in front of us, old elephant dung. Also areas that they like. So we'll see. Hopefully. There's a great go away bird making its call, telling us to go try our luck somewhere else. I presume. Not too friendly of you. Our friend the lion has come this way. Alright, seems like Byron managed to find another pigeon. <laughs> so let's over to him and see which one he's got. It's a dove. It's a dove, Ellie. The emerald spotted wood dove. Beautiful emerald spotted wood dove perched in the tree. That left of that. Um, if we go slowly, folks, it just left. Oh, there's an African hoopoe in the light. There's a lot of birds in that tree now. The emerald spotted wood dove, the African hoopoe. And if we go up, there's some golden breasted buntings. Let's just see. The, the, look, actually, that's a little chagra that you can see there. It looks like a brown crowned chagra. It's heads in the shadow. I can't actually see now. And a golden breasted bunting up there too. The shagras have flown off. Just uh, there we go. Just to the left of the screen there. Fergs, you can just see that golden breasted bunting. There we go. And no, no, up, up, sorry. Up, there we go. There we go. Beautiful golden breasted bunting. Oh, another little bird party. Nice to see that chagra, because they often fly very quickly. Huh. That's nice. Some wonderful birds. Hope all of you have got your bird lists out and you're ticking away if there are some birds that you haven't seen yet. I can hear... The a brown crown chagra actually calling in the distance. Uh, no, wait. How, how did, uh, no, actually, I can't do it. I can't do a brown crown chagra call. I'll play it for you quickly. Let me do that rather. Um, and then there's also the sound of the the chin spot batters. Three black mice. <laughs> James is going to shout at me again. That's what the chin spot batter sounds like. Let me find the um, chagra. Chagra for you quickly. Vicky, number 39 on your bird list. Oh, keep going, Vicky. Keep ticking those birds away. This is the brown crown chagra. 
hear that beautiful call. <laughs> lovely, lovely call of the brown crown chagra. That's what I heard in the distance. And then let me just play the batters for you, the chin spot batters. And um, like I said, James gets very upset when I say it sounds like it's saying three blind mice. That's how they describe it. And let's let me play and see what it sounds like. That's it. So James says you have to be tone deaf if you think it sounds like three blind mice. <laughs> so now I just do it to aggravate him, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> and that's a lovely view of the emerald spotted wood dove. And a forktail drongo now in the distance. Look at that. Sure, Fergs. That is very cool. <laughs> Justin, you say you're curious what the bird party is celebrating. Yeah, a warm winter's morning, Justin. That's what mm -hmm. they're celebrating. That's a great shot. Look at that. Emerald spotted wood dove in the foreground. Fork-tailed fork drongo in the background. Ferg's playing with the focus. <laughs> That's very cool. That is awesome. Uh, meter, good morning meter. Now meter's only eight years old and meter you say you wish you could fly and you'd come visit us. That would be wonderful meter. Imagine that. You could migrate with some of the some of the summer birds and come visit us in the summer. But it's not the only animal to land. It's not the only bird to land on animals' meter. Um, I've seen um, egrets. Uh, you get these cattle egrets that sometimes sit on buffalo and elephant, and just to get a basically a free ride. Because what happens is when a lot of these animals walk through the grass, they disturb insects, and as those insects fly up from the ground from the ground. These birds will dive down and catch them. Forktail drongos are another good example. Um, some of the starlings. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they sit on some of the animals' backs from time to time. But, but in terms of sitting and grooming and cleaning the animals, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's the only of the oxpeckers that I've ever seen do that here. But the other birds do follow these animals and will sometimes sit on them, but purely to catch insects that are disturbed while these animals are walking around. We're having a wonderful birding morning. This is really, really great. I think it's because of this warm weather we're having now, or the weather's warming up rather. Well, Niku, Niku, you asked what tree is the dove in? It is in a knob thorn. What have you found down there, folks? Uh, oh, what is that? Where is that? Let me try using my binoculars. Down bottom left. Bottom left. Where did it go now? A southern black tit that I see that just flew off, but that is, I just can't make out what it is now on the screen. I need to find it in there. Trying to use my binoculars. Is that it there? Another got that bird. I can just see is it in the top of the tree. Mm -hmm. 
sorry everyone, I couldn't find it with my binoculars and I can't see on the screen. Maybe if you got a screenshot of it, I'll try and identify it when we get back. I, I, did, I just didn't get a good look at it at all and see what it was. I don't want to give you the wrong bird name. I want to be 100% sure. I'm just scanning this area quickly just to see if there's another one jumping around. Well, we weren't really doing a lot of tracking, we were doing some backtracking because <laughs> we had all the lion tracks so we wanted to see how long it had walked because there aren't too many vehicles driving around the area so just to give everyone a bit of an idea, let me just grab the map and just show you roughly how much it walked. I don't know if you can... sorry, I don't know if you can see it or if the screen is too dark. Hopefully this will work. So I think it's quite interesting just to have an idea of how much they have been walking in a night. Mm, do I need to put it on the dashboard? Maybe it's easier. Alright, I think we can see it there. So this blue spot it's where we are and we have come all the way so you see up here so this is where we last had the tracks and I think they came from this side everything over here this is torchwood so it came onto this road walked 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 all the way up here walked 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 come on walked walked all the way came down via Tela Dam over here that big dam then carried on coming around here carried on walking went all the way up then Poof, all the way into Buffalsock. So if you see, he's pretty much walked a very big line like whoop and then all the way up. So just mind all the red pins. I don't even remember what they stand for. <laughs> but it seems like he's managed to walk quite a bit. So I would say maybe he's walked all of the road called Central, which is quite a long one, all the way to the dam and then all the way onto Gallagher Shortcut and then all the way up. So I think in total, what do you say, Craig? Maybe about five, six Ks? I would say, yeah, around right about there, which I don't think it's too much. And then he was found north in Buffalsook with the rest of the pride. And apparently they were still walking. I'm not too sure which pride it is. They haven't mentioned it yet. Um, but it seems like he was quite busy. And some of the tracks were on top of the, of the vehicle tracks from last night. And you could see there was still a bit of moisture. And I thought we were going to maybe find a bit more. But unfortunately... We didn't, but it's, uh, I'm sure it was early morning when, you know, when it was still wet because I woke up around about 5.30 this morning and as I was coming out there was a lot of, it was almost like a small drizzle so I think that's perhaps the time, the time that it started walking or maybe a bit early around about 5, 5.30 in the morning then pretty much did half of Juma and then went back out before half past 6. So how's that? It's quite a lot. I mean considering that maybe he had what, about an hour, an hour and a half I think quite a big quite a big walk for these guys and sometimes it's just funny how much they can walk during the night because you'll see them well if they don't have to they'll walk shorter distances but when they do they can properly mission hello girl I think we've got a beautiful water buck on this side I think also she's warming up good to see you beautiful creatures aren't they and they always look so fluffy with their heart-shaped noses hello girl are you also warming up I think it was definitely a lot cooler in, on this side of the reserve because everything seems that it's starting to get active a bit more slower than the rest of the other areas and she's not by herself. Uh, we can't see them from where we're standing, but I think there's another one hiding just behind her somewhere in the bushes. So normally the female water bucks that will um, live in small groups, small associations of, of females and youngsters. And then <laughs> look at that nose going up and down. Do it again. <laughs> I think she's sniffing us, just catching a bit of the air and what we are and what we're doing. And she's just like, ah, no lion, we're fine looking quite white and of course there's a very characteristic circle in her rump that follow me sign but I think now she's decided to maybe go and follow the rest of her group 
Maybe catching breakfast first. Our Laura Moore, you say that it looks like she's made of silver. Yes, I agreed. And she looks quite silvery this morning. I think she's looking quite light between, you know, the, the, the soft winter light and the shade. But she's looking stunning and she's still looking to be in a very good condition. Lucky for us, can't really smell her because water bugs tend to be quite smelly creatures. So I think she's quite a bit far away from us. But, hmm, I think breakfast is getting in her way. And she's going to carry on there. Right, and we shall leave her to breakfast, saying she wants to have it in peace, and then we will carry on. I will start imagining Amanda's breakfast from for the morning. I don't think I had enough coffee, so I might be getting hungry sooner this morning. Hmm. All right, bye-bye, girl. Good to see you are not lying on breakfast. I want to see if maybe some more of the trucks come around this way, but we'll see. We're going to head to the southern side of the reserve now and see what's been happening down there. Perhaps we'll bump into something else, more Ellie's. So you should tell, Ashes had a question about the backtracking of the lion. Can you just repeat that question for me? I didn't get the whole thing. Um, you okay? So you're wondering how do we know in such uh, in such detail where they have come from and where they have moved, and if they have a chip or a tracking device? Um, no, nope, they don't have any tracking device. And even if they did, in this particular areas, whenever they put a tracking device on an animal, it's just mainly done for for research purposes. So we don't have access to that data. It's not like we could go out and be like, okay. Lion, where are you? And then we go. So we, we do it old school, which is always quite exciting. So we were just following the tracks on the road. So we know where it went because we could always see the tracks on the road. In some of the spaces, I think it maybe went a bit off road because we couldn't find the tracks in the road for a few meters or so, but then they came back onto the road. So we just pretty much followed him all the way back to, to well, well, we think he started walking or up to the area where we could um, follow him. So that's the only reason the only reason why just looking at the tracks and seeing seeing where he had stepped on and how fresh the tracks looks or how old that they looked and, and so on so it was quite exciting to backtrack a lion <laughs> i think this is the first time that i've managed to do it for quite a distance but i see here that there are some li little lion-hearted creatures running on in front of us on the road and they were also sunbathing and now stopping a dwarf mongoose I'd, I'd, I'm not going to try and attempt to backtrack this one because I'm pretty sure I would fail. <laughs> They're a bit too small. <laughs> Alright, off the road you go. Cool, well, it's good to see that they're around here. I think, let's see if maybe there are a few more because I see there's a termite mound to our left and I wonder if perhaps they're all actually just starting to come out from the termite mound, starting to get active for the day. I think they might. They're all, all around the termite mound, starting to come out and sunning themselves. There we go. I think there are some to the left. There we go. There's one definitely sunning itself. Oh, there's a second one also moving around. Hey guys. Oh, you see. Can't look over the grass or what it's done. Very typical of the meerkats that you see in documentaries. Stood on its back legs. Just having a look around. Seeing if there is anything that they should worry about. Beautiful guys. I think there are maybe about four, five, six, seven, eight of them in total scattered all around. And I'm sure the one that we saw on the road definitely came from this mound. So maybe they're just they've warmed up already and they can they feel that they can get their day started, just starting to look for food, abandoning the mound and then carry on going somewhere else, perhaps onto another termite mound throughout the day. <laughs> but I think they're still a bit oh, still a bit nervous. I love this little mongoose. I find them so entertaining. I wish we could see uh, the banded mongoose as well, which are maybe about four or five times the size of these little ones. And they're called banded because they have prominent bands 
on their back. And they're also just as naughty and as beautiful, but you see, all of them are now, because they're so small, they're all standing on t the higher parts of the termite mound just to be able to see what's happening all around. <laughs> but you guys are doing it wrong, you're all in the shade. Ryan, you're wondering if there are any animals that respond better to female voices. Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think there have been any studies done on how the difference between a f a female and male voice affect wildlife. I just think in general they... Oh my god, it's a jackal! Coming off the road! <gasps> I'm so excited. <laughs> Sorry, we haven't seen a jackal in so long. Hello! Oh my god, this is wonderful! A side strap jackal. <gasps> Yay! <laughs> How was that for a surprise? It seems like it's been the surprise morning, just when we were, we were expecting it the least. It came running, trotting up on the road. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> That was sorry. I got I got very excited there. Um, so yes, I don't I don't know if there are any studies that have been done regarding if animals react better to particular types of voices. I would assume that as long as you're not shouting, that seems to to work the best for all of them because they are used to voices or human voices in general. But uh, they're also used to them being on a certain decibel, certain loud level of loudness if I can say it that way so as long as I don't start shouting or making more high-pitched noises than what I can normally do then they seem to be fine and to be quite relaxed I think you guys are very confused you need to go a bit more into the shade let's go oh, okay they might go away but maybe they'll relax I just want to see if maybe we go slightly forward then we'll be able to get a bit of a better look at them perhaps a jackal will come back again yeah, we were talking about jackals earlier on. How perfect was that? Chantel's just saying that it seems like we are all still too excited about the jackal. I'm hoping it's gonna come back again because we don't see them often and it was looking also so nice and silvery. But now going back to our small and brown friends over here, I think there are about maybe 10, 15 of them all, all over the place. So it's funny sometimes how we, you know, how we drive around and we think that there's nothing and then look at them! <laughs> Francis from Israel, you're wondering if the jackal would take a mongoose. Ah, there it is again in front of us, the jackal. Um, it could, it definitely could take a mongoose. Uh, I would have to get to it first and I wonder if the mongoose are not all standing there just looking after themselves just in case. But this one also seems to be a young jackal. Are you young? Oh, it looks, it, it's almost got the typical puppy face. I think maybe I need to clean my binoculars a bit better. Well, let's see. Hello boy. Or girl, I'm sorry. Definitely looks like a pup to me. Or, well, not a pup, but a younger one. Oh, precious. Very happy. You see, very curious. So it, just, it came running up the road and then all of the birds were making a noise all around here. And I was like, well, maybe there's something. Uh, but I was thinking more of something like a snake. And then he came around and then the birds started calling again. And that's where he came back onto the road. Or it came back into the road. Oh, how stunning. How relaxed. Don't chase him away, birds. We're happy to see the jackal. You see, also, one of the smaller creatures. Stevie, you're wondering if jackals are related to hyenas. Um, no, they're not related to hyenas. Hyenas are in their own separate family and they're pretty much only related to other hyenas. So, jackals are more closely related to some canids, so to some dog species. Somebody's getting brave. I hear the squirrels in the distance. Oh, this is wonderful. So curious. I 
Ashes, you're wondering what the difference between a jackal and a coyote is. Well, um, we get them in different parts of the world, so the we don't get coyotes here. And as far as I know, coyotes are much bigger than a jackal. I think jackals are more the size of a fox, and as far as I understand, coyotes are, are a lot bigger. And I would say that I'm sure genetically they're also very different animals. But um, we don't get any coyotes here, we just get the jackals. Well, we get two species of jackals, the one that we were looking at, the side stripe, and then we get the black back, and the black back has got a very dark black part of it. It's not too far from the... oh no, it ran away. There it goes, moving away in between the bushes. I wonder if it was actually not after some of this mongoose and then got a bit distracted. Huh! But how amazing was that? That was super cool! <laughs> Very happy to have seen a jackal this morning. I haven't seen one since I started at Juma. So, good choice of road. You see the backtracking of the lion led us to the jackal, which I'm very happy about. Bye-bye, mongoose. Ah, wonderful. Yay. <laughs> Let's see what else this road has in store for us. Rajni, you're wondering if I should send some of my lucky beans to Byron. I haven't found any more lucky beans, unfortunately. I am desperately looking for them, but I haven't found them just yet. So when I do, I will spread them and share the joy. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to find some, but it's... Lucky beans are a creeper. Uh, let's go over to Byron and we're gonna wish him and send him all the possible luck that we've got so off you go Byron there's our luck going to you wherever you are so now what I what I might do maybe maybe in July so you stay tuned for this what I might do and I'll see maybe if I need to ask permission for this but I'll show you what a what a bush breakfast can entail um, so if I've got guests, sometimes I'll take them out, we'll do our drive, our safari, and then we'll stop and I'll prepare bacon and eggs and, um, and maybe croissants. I'll do all of that um, out in the bush with a little gas burner. And um, we have bacon and egg rolls. I spilt a little bit of coffee there. Bacon and egg rolls um, out in the bush. So I think maybe I'll show you what that entails, show you some of my cooking skills. And um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a nice way to enjoy the bush. Mm. Now I need to give you a tip of the day. Um, Byron's tip of the day for Tuesday. What is it? Uh, what can it be today? I've, I was thinking a, a lot of different tips and obviously they come in and then they go out again when, I, when I'm busy looking for wildlife. Uh, tip of the day, um, I think is, I've, I've mentioned this tip, I think it was one of my first tips um, that, that I gave to the viewers is always be prepared when you go out on safari always take a jacket or a warm coat or something with you even in summer just bring the right clothing with because um you never know the temperature can change quite drastically but in winter definitely remember to bring jackets um and perhaps gloves or beanies because it does get cold in the morning and uh, what happens is it's not um as cold as it is probably where you live but because you're out on the vehicle and you're driving that wind chill just keeps keeps or basically keeps you cold for a lot longer so the chill starts to set in so always take warm clothing with you in winter when you do go on safari even though you think the temperatures look like it's not going to be too bad the mornings and the evenings it does get cold out on the vehicles so that's an important tip. Just remember the clothing that you take with you needs to be quite warm. Definitely wanes and they um and they become a lot more or they, they definitely keep that distance between people and, and themselves. Now 
Now, now, Ali has managed to find a bird of prey. I'm actually going to go back the other way. Let's go and have a look what Ali's bird is. We did. I think it's the same one that Byron was looking at earlier. Well, not the same individual, but the same species, a batelier eagle or a short-tailed eagle. And he is looking quite happy out in the sun. And I think he's quite funny because if you see that what he's doing, he is just pretty much warming up the back of his wings and his neck. That's why he's in such a funny position because the east is towards where his um, back is facing to. And then obviously the, the sun ray is going to come a bit stronger if he faces that way. So I'm sure he's just warming his back. You know, like us humans do around a fire, <laughs> warming up the neck. I go around and then maybe if he gets a bit too hot on the back, then he's going to start facing the sun again. But he comes and goes. Also birds at the bottom of their tails or towards where, the, where their tail feathers are connected to the body, there's a gland there called the preening gland and it produces a certain oil or a type of oil that helps the the birds in general maintain their feather condition so sometimes if it's been very cold they also they'll stand facing or with their backs facing the sun so that this oil can start almost like warming up and loosening up a little so i'm sure maybe it's got some of the old oil that's you know it, it needs to warm up and start becoming a, a bit more liquid maybe it's, it's almost formed into into a harder substance and he could just perhaps also be cold. So it's serving a double function, trying to maintain his feather condition just by taking it easy and allowing everything to to start warming up so he can then start grooming himself and, you know, just, just becoming a bit more hot in such a hot day. <laughs> I love it when they put their heads like that. It's just so funny, isn't it? It's almost like a cat when they, when they put their, their necks all the way up when they're being tickled or something along those lines. Very hairy heads, look at that. Almost looks like a very ungroomed boy. I think this is what Tristan looks like when he wakes up with all that hair and all that beard. <laughs> Beautiful. And we know it's a boy because it's missing the, you see that big gray part on the wing? It doesn't have a white one underneath. So normally those females will have just in between the gray and the black, they will have a white band. So they, these are, actually funny enough, we were talking about it earlier, about uh, animals that are monogamous. This is one of them. Sorry, I didn't catch the name, sweet uh, something, Chantal. You're wondering w which is Asievo, what's been my favorite bird of prey fighting. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, um, I've seen fish eagles fighting and I think that's cool be because they're sighting. Ah, sighting with an S and not fighting. Okay. Best bird of prey sighting. Hmm. I don't know. Let me think about it. I think maybe there was one occasion. It was the very first time I went into the Kruger National Park and it was in the middle or at the beginning of the... Yeah, it was the beginning of the rainy season, so lots of baby impalas all around. We actually saw a massive tawny eagle come down and catch one of the lambs. And then, you know, this poor little lamb, it was pretty much a newborn, and it came all the way from the sky, and then grabbed and then, you know, flew flew away with it. Just not too far, just a few meters and then, and then, you know, another few meters and so on, because it was a bit too heavy, but to me that was such a visual reminder of how strong some of those birds are because we see them up there in the you know on top of the trees and they're so far that you don't actually realize just how big they can get or how powerful uh, so that was a very good reminder and like okay so this thing is actually big because it can very easily grab like a small dog or a cat or pretty much anything else so I think that that was I don't know if it was my best sighting, but it's one of the ones that I remember the most just because of how strange this whole situation was. But other than that, I don't know. I enjoy bateliers. I think out of the eagles they might be my favorites just because they're so fluffy and full of feathers and I just find them interesting as, as creatures. When I used to work in the rehabilitation center, we had a batelier that unfortunately had a broken wing, so he couldn't be released back into the wild. And his name was Mr. Chicken. And <laughs> Mr. Chicken absolutely loved being tickled on his neck, just like this one is doing. So he would come up to you, and they would start pretty much making a noise, and it was almost like it was 
shouting at you until you know you tickled his back for a little while and then he would be happy and then he would carry on hopping and going somewhere else so it was uh, I think that's probably why I think it's one of the most favorite ones exactly like this one is going he would go like that just put his neck up but then it would not shut up until you started tickling his neck and once you did then everything was fine and then he would forgive you and then carry on well, maybe it was his way of reminding us all that he was actually, you know, the Mr. Chicken and we were just all of his little slaves. I would, wouldn't put it past a battalion <laughs> to have that kind of of perception of humans. And he's looking stunning with all those colors. Very peaceful morning for him. if there's a visual difference between adults and juveniles yes there is it's quite a quite a notorious difference so this that we're looking at this is an adult and you can see the beautiful colors you can see the red and the beak and the legs uh, if he were to move you can see that he's black and gray and the youngsters it takes him actually quite a few years sometimes up to you I don't know maybe six seven years to get all of their adult plumage and it's a way of them of being allowed to be in certain areas for a little bit longer because other eagles or other battaliers are only going to start fighting the youngsters once they have all their adult colors and therefore not youngsters anymore but um, let me just show you on the book so you'll have a bit more of a of a difference so the adult battalier is the one that we've got over here so you see the colors, the red of the bill, the underwing, the the black, and then the juveniles are this ones. So you see the juvenile is pretty much all brown, and then even the face, the face is not red yet, the face is, almost looks blue, of a blue color, so they're much, much duller colors and they don't look all that pretty. And then even when they're flying, you can just see the difference between them. Because you see, they will be dark all throughout, and then as they start getting older, then they'll start getting the white and the underwings, and then they'll start looking like this, depending if they're a female or a male. So this one, definitely an adult. I'm sure they form monogamous pairs, so I'm sure there's another, or there's a female somewhere around this area. Haven't seen it, maybe that's the one that Byron had earlier on. But I think we're going to leave this wonderful Mr. Batelier onto his sunning days. And let's see what else is on the road. So far it's proven to be quite an interesting road. And all because of a lion backtracking. <laughs> which is great. So we'll see. You never know what it is around the corner. And we especially did not think we were going to see a beautiful jackal this morning. Or a Batelier. I haven't been able to see one in, in quite a while. Mm. Uh, we are luckily still in a gremlin free zone and just going down the same road we are on Chitta cut line so we are on our boundary or one of our boundaries just seeing if there's anything around here that might prove quite interesting this word uh, this word this road has not disappointed yet so I have so I have high hopes for it we'll see what else is around here and there's a All right, James, I don't know if you'll know this tree, but you're more than welcome to try and see if you if you can tell what it is, the one over here. Very distinctive little leaves. They grow on both sides of the main stem, you know, multi-stem tree. Very, very big spines. Right, so I'll tell you why this tree is my least favorite tree of them all. And I am a tree person and I love them, but this one, this one's not my friend. Now, it's before I say bad things about this tree, let me tell you the name. This tree over here, it's called the sickle bush. All of this one around here. Now, sickle bush has a few interesting facts around it and overall it's a good tree and you know, I should probably not say bad things about it. But um, the reason why I don't like this tree is because, let me just make it quite obvious. Where are you? You're not going to help me now, are you? There we go. These very sharp spines that you see here. These things. If you're a guide and you have to drive off road and you find one of these trees or many of them, these things, they are so strong, they can actually go straight through your tire and then they'll give you a flat tire straight away. 
and there there will just be no hope and also it's very very hard wood so you can't really drive over them or negotiate around them so whenever you're driving and I see the sickle bush I'm like oh my god <laughs> I know what's gonna happen now so lots of them all around thankfully we don't see them around this area all too much normally they we tend to believe that they well, not us but research shows that they grow in areas that are quite disturbed so in many areas that used to be cattle farms and now you've got um, sickle bush trees it's because they're, they're a woody plant that is able to to germinate quite quickly and then dominate in a specific area so they some research pointed towards the fact that they are what they call a natural plaster a natural band-aid let me just plug myself in here so they'll be they'll grow and they'll take over an area but the problem is that in particular areas that have been overworked and like i said especially if you go to cattle farms where the you know there's been a lot of trampling of the grass and taking out of the grass they'll grow very tightly packed next to one another and it makes it pretty much impossible to go through it'll be easy for certain animals but you'll find even big animals like perhaps like rhinos buffaloes elephants they'll have to go around those very thick plugs because there's just no way of going in so some studies pointed towards the fact that perhaps the sickle bush was a way of allowing the soil underneath to to recover just because they, they grow so so tightly packed together and they don't allow pretty much any animals to come and feed in that area or not too many animals move through in that area so it's almost like they give that particular land a way a, a time to recover and just make sure that the nutrients are coming back that other species can start um, growing in that area and just just moving around so i know it's quite unfair to say that i don't really like this tree because i'm just being very practical here but it is they've they've got their purpose like everything else does out in the bush so they they are actually quite important and whenever you see them like obviously this doesn't particularly mean that it's a bad area but um but yeah, not my favorite one. Ashes, you say that they could make good arrowheads. They're very, they're, they're deadly, these pines. Like, more often than not, even if you go on a bushwalk, I've had it many times where you're just walking in the bush and somebody will step on a sickle bush spine and then it goes straight through your shoe. I think Tristan, at one point also, he, he was off-roading and he, I don't know what he did, and he hurt his hand and he had like a whole spine that went inside of his finger, his... Um, thumb and he just didn't get it out for quite a while and then it got infected and got very nasty so it's it's a tree that you've got to respect because it's a tree that's very capable of standing its ground and just making sure that everything turns away and and goes somewhere else but for the local culture also quite an important tree it helps uh, normally with the um, snake and, and scorpion stings i believe that they make some sort of concoction out of the roots and then mix them with water and it helps with the with the pain in particular especially because in this area we've got some scorpions that are nasty or that give really bad bites so apparently sickle bush helps and then i don't know if you've ever seen them but they're little pods on top they they have you can rattle them and they make a little bit of a sound so sometimes in the local communities they collect them to make little rattles or toys for babies which is quite useful. So again, I don't know, I feel bad saying that this is my least favorite tree, but it definitely is. I think there's a car coming, so I'm just gonna get out of the road. Whoa. Nice and warm there. And I, as I was saying, just before I lost you earlier, just saw some, uh, some guests all sitting out, uh, all standing out rather, having their morning coffee. Stopped their vehicle, the guide got them all out the vehicle, nicely stretched the legs. And, um, and they were all having their tea or coffee this morning. We've passed two vehicles actually that just stopped. Uh, Brian, are you asking about my bush cuisine? And if it wouldn't attract animals, no, Brian, not necessarily. Um, I, I mean, the, the 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 smell in that of the food, that's an unnatural smell to the animals. It doesn't smell like like a carcass, for example. If it did, my food wouldn't be that very good. <laughs> now, um, uh, so no, Brian, not necessarily. If anything, um, maybe hyena would uh, investigate, but. Um, but not during the day necessarily. They usually move they move off or they don't come close to you during the day. But at night, I have been brying at night. Now, bry is 
uh, the South African version of a barbecue, so cooking on a fire, and um, and we were brying, uh, this has happened many, many times, brying at night, and Ahina have come and walked around the edge of, just the, the edge of the, the light of the fire that the fire gives off, just investigating, seeing if there's any bits or pieces of meat that they can maybe steal. Um, but with Ahina, if you make a noise or clap your hands, they'll usually just run away. But you do still have to be very careful, they are powerful animals. But they get curious and they are um, opportunistic. So I have had a hyena many times come and investigate my cooking in the evening. Is at night the predator's senses, for example. So when we say animals act differently to people at night, let's just focus on the predators for now. So lion, leopard, hyena. Oh, hang on, there's a beautiful bird of prey that just flew up there. Is that a brown snake eagle? I caught a glimpse of it. What was it? It is indeed a brown snake eagle sitting right up at the top of that tree. Wonderful. Beautiful light on it now too. Should see that very clear yellow eye and those those long legs without the feathers. Sharp beak. Very clear brown snake eagle. Now, while that brown snake eagle sits there, let me carry on with that story. Um, well, answer, Tess. Um, so, the predators, like lion, leopard, and hyena, at night, their senses are so much better than ours. So, they can see and smell and hear far better than we can. So, at night, what happens is, we can't see as well, and their, their senses are so good, so they are able to probably judge situations a bit better than we can and if they see us before we see them then uh, they will react differently so their behavior does change they become a little bit uh, a little bit braver um, they'll probably take a chance of getting a bit closer than they usually would whereas during the day they're obviously quite exposed and we can see them clearly so their behavior does change slightly in the evenings and they um, there, there is definitely a, a change. There goes the brown snake eagle. Off it goes. Wonderful, wonderful bird of prey to see. Just sitting in the back there. So yes, there's definitely a change in behavior um, with these animals at night and compared to during the day. Um, obviously with the herbivores and that it's a bit different but um, um, you've you've got to always just be careful of them but uh, the predators yes be careful at night and that's why my tip of the day the other day was um, always be careful when walking around at night during the in the camp um, and I don't mean just wandering around never do that but at night what happens when you are in Africa if you at some of the private camps you get escorted back to your rooms um, for dinner or, or back to the deck for dinner um, and um, and there you'll have either a guide or camp security walking you to and from your room because animals often pass through the camps. So you've got to be very careful because at night you might not necessarily see them, but they'll definitely see you. And you can find yourself in some hot water if you're not careful and don't know what to do. So always just be careful. Come on, there's got to be something here. Is there, well, it looks like a beautiful grey heron. Let's have a look at the heron. I'm going to scan around and see if I can't find maybe a monitor lizard perhaps sunning itself out here. There we go, there's that heron. Do you enjoy seeing the herons around here? Mm, doesn't look like anything else is here at the moment not that I can see I can hear a squirrel alarm calling behind me I think it was that so I think that squirrel and the Franklin that was calling back there I think it was because of that brown snake eagle they often alarm call at them because it's a bird of prey. 
Maybe gave them a bit of a bit of a fright. Mr. Mr. P, you asked, um, was it how do we spot birds? Is that was that it? Well, um, Mr. P, well, it's while we're driving, you just uh, you just look around. You'll see the birds flying. You'll see um, you'll hear a call, perhaps. Um, you know, when you arrive at um, at a water hole like this. Birds come down to drink. Some grey go away birds calling at the moment. They've flown into the area. Cape turtle dove calling. Uh, Rashni, that bird call that you asked, uh, which one sounds like it's saying work harder, work harder. There's some terrapin. Is that a terrapin? Yeah, sticking its head out the water. A little terrapin. And now, Rashni, that bird is the Cape turtle dove. Work harder, work harder. And then I always joke around and say, well, in the afternoon, it sounds like it's saying. Drink lager, drink lager. <laughs> oh, there's not too much happening around the dam. Let's carry on. We'll just check down uh, the road up ahead and see if we can't find anything that's maybe moving out or into the drainage line down to my left. I haven't heard a single alarm call this morning at all. Um, Ali, Ali's getting an idea of what my game drive has been like this morning. Let's go and find out where she's headed. <laughs> Byron, you always make me laugh. I think maybe we should call him Byron, the king of birds. I'm sure he would he would like it quite quite a bit. Um, because he has been super lucky with all the bigger creatures or well the bigger birds. Let's put it that way <laughs> I'm actually enjoying the drive. Thank you for asking though Just thought we would come and have a look around this particular area So we're in the southern section of Juma because it seems like Shadow and Shangile seem to And to an extent Tamba seem to kind of enjoy walking around here and then popping in the last bit of drive So I just thought maybe we would come down here see if there's anything around or you know the famous last minute leopard that, that would also be something to witness but so far so good <laughs> we haven't seen much though it seems like it's been quite quiet all the way up there don't go come back no there we go and judging by the underwing you see it's got a lot of white underneath the wing that is a female so it could be that this is the the mate for the one that we saw earlier on. Oh, uh, hello, that's wonderful. So we found a male and a female today. So you see, unlike some other eagles, you can see that they're not that stable when they fly. So that the lack of a long tail is what gives them that rocking motion when they fly, but it's also what allows them to, to turn quickly when they're flying around. Because big tail, you need to kind of... So the one that we saw earlier on, Oh, uh, hello, that's wonderful. So we found a male and a female today. So you see, unlike some other eagles, you can see that they're not that stable when they fly. So that the lack of a long tail is what gives them that rocking motion when they fly, but it's also what allows them to, to turn quickly when they're flying around. Because big tail, you need to kind of... So the one that we saw earlier on. Oh, uh, hello, that's wonderful. So we found a male and a female today. So you see, unlike some other eagles, you can see that they're not that stable when they fly. 
So that the lack of a long tail is what gives them that rocking motion when they fly, but it's also what allows them to to turn quickly when they're flying around. Because big tail, you need to kind of so the one that we saw earlier on. Oh, uh, hello! That's wonderful. So we found a male and a female today. So you see, unlike some other eagles, you can see that they're not that stable when they fly. So that the lack of a long tail is what gives them that rocking motion when they fly, but it's also what allows them to to turn quickly when they're flying around. Because big tail, you need to kind of so the one that we saw earlier on. Oh, uh, hello! That's wonderful. So we found a male and a female today. <laughs> well, this is a class I can get to leopard sighting. <laughs> Hey, you wanted to see a leopard draped over a tree? There we go. That's the best I could do. Now, this tree has started to creak and it's moving slightly. So, I don't know if it's, it's steady enough. Look at my balance. Isn't that amazing? Karate kid. <laughs> okay, now let's see if I can get down here quickly. Hold on, I'm coming back. Let me run back quickly. It's my exercise for the day. See, it just shows you if something was chasing me, I could definitely run away in time. See, sidestep like a scrub here. <laughs> oh dear. Well, that's definitely warmed me up. A little bit of exercise. I'm back, everyone. No sign of animals yet. Bar that majestic leopard we just had on the tree <laughs> Kudu Africana <laughs> Hello, good morning you say I make a great leopard, thank you, thank you I wonder yeah <laughs> Oh dear. What chucks are these? Hang on. Uh, uh, Justin, you asked how good my leopard sawing impression is. I don't know. Let's let's uh, let's see if I can do it. <clears throat> oh. Was it close enough? I think so, I don't know. Maybe, sometimes I get it a little bit better than other times. I don't think that was very good. Now I'm just having a look here. Now this is interesting, hold on a second, I want to show you these tracks. Because we spoke about this the other day. And now let me just jump off here quickly. Now, have a look at these tracks that we've got now they start over here and um, well you can see the scuff marks actually in the sand now this is a hyena but this hyena has definitely been running and I'll tell you why I say that is because the stride the the gap between the the the, the paws is quite um, quite large and also I can see how this hyena is he's clearly stood and and he's hit the ground while he's running so as they run they hit the ground and then and basically kick off so there's a lot of sand that's been spread out of the track so it's a clear running track that this hyena has been running down the road um, and but because someone asked me the other day how can you tell if an animal's running and it's the gait obviously the gait changes the the length of the the stride and um, but also here this is very clear how this hyena has kicked out some of the sand while and scuffed the sand up while it's running so this hyena was running along the road probably earlier this morning or last night that's interesting to see but you can see that very clearly how that hyena was running, maybe heard or smelled something. I was trying to.
really warming up now. Maybe it's all my running around. <laughs> and thank you very much. You said my dewlap isn't very impressive. That's good. I don't want a dewlap just yet. <laughs> so thank you and thank you. I'll take that as a huge compliment. <laughs> a lot more if I got a dewlap now, I think. The hornbill just flew in front of us. Let's see if we can get a view of it. It's always nice to see these hornbills. It's perched just on that bare branch. Red-billed hornbill. Oh, there it goes. Off it goes. See that undulating flight pattern? Where it kind of up and down, up and down. A few flaps of the wing. Oh, there we go. And landed in the grass. It may have been you may have seen or is looking for an insect there. The hornbills do catch and feed on insects. So I do think that's exactly what that hornbill is doing. Looking through the, the grassy area around here for um, for some some insects. Now, speaking about the trees in the area, you can actually see there's some beautiful trees. This tree off to our left, that beautiful apple leaf really stands out large apple leaf and I was laughing earlier because Ali had that uh, sickle bush and she was saying how the sickle bush can really destroy vehicles and also give Land Rovers flat tires so um, we always used to it was a bit of a joke when they asked what the scientific name um, or the Latin name of the sickle bush is we would always say Land Rovers flat tires <laughs> That is, of course, not the scientific name of the sickle bush. It's, in fact, Dicrostachys cinerea. Oh, hang on. Oh, hang on, hang on. Uh, okay, we're quickly going to... I saw a little bug fly past. I'm going to see if I can find it. But while I do that, let's head to the tree expert, Ali. Okay, the tree expert is trying to reverse to have a look at a tree. No, I'm joking. We actually had a little bird of prey. Oh, I don't know how we're going to be able to watch it. Can you see it there? I just think maybe if I go like this, because otherwise we'll scare it away. That has got a kill. Yeah. So I'm not too sure what... Okay, I can turn. Sorry, guys. I'm going to try to turn so that we can have a kill before the show ends because this is quite exciting all right oh, okay well the car <laughs> stole i made it stall. all right let's see what it is all right so very distinctly this will be a new add-on for someone's list very happy that we even got we got a leopard a byron leopard and a kill all in one drive <laughs> so exciting little did we know that we were going to have such a wonderful morning safari so how's that i think it's been quite a quite an interesting morning lots of little surprises here and there and i'm sure we're all very happy to see them all around there let's just try and see if maybe he's gonna fly away and see what it is that it's got just to try and solve the mystery I can see it's been feeding off of it ah, maybe it's a squirrel come on little one the mystery another little gray mystery to end the drive just perfect how exciting looking all around, looking at all of us. Fortunately it's come to the time of the day where we need to say goodbye to all of you but we're gonna do it watching this fantastic creature. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you again this afternoon hopefully for some more entertainment.